and welcome to the EBPL podcast, brought to you by the East Brunswick Public Library. We are known as our community's living room, so in this podcast, you will enjoy original, exclusive content, as well as encore presentations from events you have missed. This event was presented as part of our Just for the Health of It initiative. Just for the Health of It is a proprietary health literacy program developed by the East Brunswick Public Library to promote health literacy in Middlesex County. To learn more, visit justforthehealthofit.org. Now, enjoy the program. Hello. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for today's Astera Cancer Class, Empowering Patients and Families Experiencing Cancer, Navigating the Cancer Journey. My name is Kathy Chern, and I'm a consumer health librarian at East Brunswick Public Library. Today's program is brought to you by Astera Cancer Care and the Library's Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Our speaker today is Tina Bassanis. Tina is an experienced healthcare leader and palliative care nurse practitioner with over 20 years of practicing palliative medicine. She attended the accelerated second degree nursing program at William Patterson University and focused primarily on critical care, learning about the need for inpatient palliative care, and along the way established her first palliative care program after graduating from New York University as a palliative care nurse practitioner. Tina has held various clinical and leadership roles in palliative medicine and hospice, both inpatient and in the community for large healthcare systems in New Jersey. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded. Attendees are automatically muted and webcams off. When ready, the recording will be available for viewing at ebpl.org slash YouTube. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Our speaker will answer questions at the end of the talk. Please be aware that the speaker cannot provide medical advice to attendees during this program. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Tina. Hi, good morning, uh, afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am really excited and honored that you are taking some time to spend time with me this afternoon to learn about you know, this topic of the experience of living with cancer and how to navigate the cancer journey. Uh, so thank you so much for Kat to Catherine for that wonderful introduction. So I think you all got a flavor for what my background is. I'll just also add that um, I've only been with Estera about four months and I am really excited to bring palliative care and supportive care to Estera and to all of our patients at Estera. Um, and as we talk more about what palliative care is, I will talk to you a little bit more about what we're looking to do uh, at Estera. But, um, I'm, I'm ready to get going, uh, but I do want to ask you just one question. Um, it's always important to know the audience when you talk about sensitive information. Um, and so if you wouldn't mind if you could put in the chat whether you are a cancer patient, a cancer survivor, um, if you are a caregiver for someone with cancer, um, if you were previously uh, a caregiver for someone that's passed away from cancer, or if you just interested in learning about this topic so that you have more information in the future should you need it. Um, so, and then Catherine will interrupt me at some point in the lecture just to let me know sort of what the, uh, what the group is comprised of. So thanks so much for, for doing that. So if you could just send that in the chat, that would be great. So I'm gonna start with just sort of going over like, you know, what's the agenda for our hour together. Um, we're gonna talk about that moment when you get that cancer diagnosis and the impact of that, um, and then how you establish your uh, cancer care team, and then talk about empowering yourself to sort of manage this very difficult um, journey that you're about to embark on, and how to find ways to remain hopeful in that space and to make good decisions uh, about your health care because it's all. Um, you know, not everything is cookie cutter, everything is very individualized. So it's important that there's a self-advocacy part uh, component of your care that, you know, you'll have to make sure your, your providers know what you need. Um, and at the same time, you're doing um, 
things that are consistent with, with who you are um, and uh, being supported in that way. And then we're going to sort of wrap up by talking about, okay, so now let's just, let's make an action plan, right? Let's talk about how are we going to do this? How are we going to heal through this process? How are we going to continue to thrive through living with cancer? Um, and so I'm going to talk to you about some of those supports and palliative and supportive care is one of those uh, wonderful things in your toolkit. Um, that survivorship is also something that you know keeps us all together uh, throughout the course and beyond uh, the living with cancer phase. And then if you know we have a diagnosis, you know if someone has a diagnosis that's more uh, serious or complex um, or incurable, um, when is the right time to choose hospice? And I really want to spend some time talking about hospice because it's very underutilized and. Um, there are some real benefits to that. So I just wanna make sure that you're all well-informed and again, hospice is in your toolkit and it may not be that you'll ever have to use it, but if you do, it's very important that you feel confident in understanding what that program is. So that moment, right? So there's some reason that you've got some diagnostic studies done and you get that call or you come back to the office and you find out and the doctor tells you it's cancer right and what does that moment feel like right you're now joining a club that no one would ever want to join right this cancer club this group of people that have cancer um unfortunately there is a very large club you're joining because of you know it, there's all levels of cancer there's all types of cancer so not all of them are terminal cancer but to even live through the process of having cancer has its ups and downs um, and some beautiful things can come out of being sick and if any of you have uh, a serious medical condition um, or are living with cancer you'll know what i mean when i say that there's some beautiful moments that come out of um, this experience of, of sort of challenging yourself uh, through living with cancer. Um, and so you have, you, you know, you've probably heard of like, you know, Charlie Brown's teacher, right? The wah, 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 like, you know, not hearing anything. And a lot of people will say, it doesn't matter if it's stage one, if it's, you know, something that's highly curable. At the moment that you hear that you have cancer, you almost can't hear anything else at all. And so it's really important that at that at that juncture you allow yourself time to process to be okay with maybe that you didn't hear it all and it's also important that if you are going to an appointment for something like this that it is that you bring somebody with you if you have someone um it's a lot of information the doctors typically want to make sure you feel informed um and just being really honest, I've been in healthcare for 25, 26 years, worked with many providers. Uh, some people are really good at communicating this information and some are not as good at it um, and they're really not comfortable. So your experience can be varied based on the way that person that gives you the information comes across. And I think it's pretty you know, um, standard that you would think that the feelings can fluctuate from severe panic and distress, to like complete confusion, to feeling disbelief, to feeling completely like this isn't happening. Um, fear immediately going to like the end, especially if you are somebody that's um, really caught off guard by this, you know, or if you have people that are dependent on you, whether that be elder parents or small children, or, you know, um, that's that adds a whole nother layer of complexity because you say how am i going to do this right like i'm i'm the one that like carries all the load here i have a lot of responsibility i can't be sick um then the sadness and some people go through the why me some people say why not me um but it still doesn't make it go away even if you are you know feel like it could happen to anybody and you're accepting of that helplessness, hopelessness, anxiety, anger, deep, deep, deep anger, screaming. And, and, you know, you have to allow yourself that space to do that, right? And I think that this is all uh, probably something that like, is not new news. And, you know, you might be saying, you know, okay, enough about this already. But I think it's important that if it's not you receiving that, just understanding 
with all of these things come and go for the people that you love that are receiving this information. It may not be somebody that you love, it may be a coworker, right? And how do you approach them? When you now know, right, that all of these things that are documented here, every single one of them is gonna happen to each person, right? Because these are, uh, they, they, they touch all aspects of who we are. Um, you know, they, they often recommend that you pause and like really keep the news to your inner circle. You know, um, I don't know if you've had other illnesses and stuff, but where somebody will say to you, um, you know, you'll say, oh yeah, you know, I have uh, plantar fasciitis. Oh, well, I had plantar fasciitis and I had to have surgery and they had to cut into the bottom of my foot. And, you know, they'll tell you their story and it can be very, very overwhelming. Um, you know, everybody, you know, has some usually sixth degree of separation to whatever the illness is. And so to kind of find common ground, they'll share their story. And sometimes that's not the right thing for you, right? You're still processing that. It's not them talking about somebody else that they know, it's about you. So just, you know, a, a caution just to kind of keep it in your inner circle until you're really ready to share. And we're going to talk about how to share um, later. And so obviously this, as we talked about all of these different feelings that come up, that the impact is multidimensional and it affects every part of who we are. And we're obviously not just, you know, single atoms, you know, that are only made up of, of something physical or social or emotional or spiritual. It's, it's all of those things. So we'll just break down those kind of like the standard stuff, right? Like sometimes you could have like a physical pain, even though it's unrelated to your cancer, like when you feel like your throat's closing off. I mean, I've had that before. I've had anxiety, you know, where I have felt like, oh my God, like there's a lump. And a lot of people that when they get this information, either they will kind of like have an out-of-body experience or they'll have this deep, deep visceral where they feel like they're having a heart attack. Um, you know, obviously emotional distress is all the things we kind of described before, the anxiety and the panic, the depression, sadness, the hopelessness. I don't know if you've ever heard of like the term scanxiety. You know, it's it's the fear of like when you are going for that test. You had scanxiety before you found out that you had cancer, right? Because there was something that was maybe, you know, uh, suspicious. Right, so going into that, you had anxiety about that scan. Now you have anxiety about the results, right? And now, now you're in this moment receiving it. Well, if you're living with cancer, there's often a lot of diagnostics, right? So that's gonna be a recurrent theme, a recurrent impact is this anxiety associated with going back for continued surveillance, whether that be to see, you know, that the, the chemotherapy or the immunotherapy is working or the radiation is working. So you want to see that the, degree, the disease is being combated and is smaller. Um, or, you know, if they're looking at, you know, uh, survivorship and you're going once a year uh, down the road and you've been cancer free for many years, there's still anxiety. And something that most people don't talk about is some of the sexual concerns and dysfunction that's associated with the emotional distress associated with this diagnosis and living with cancer, as well as, uh, you know, some of the side effects of these medications. And there are supports to talk about those types of things because they're not as easy often to talk about. Um, but recognizing this is a part of all of us as, as, as human beings, right? That this is often, um, especially um, in younger patients that maybe st still might be in childbearing age and things like that. Uh, it, it's a big concern. Um, so, you know, there's obviously those treatment related symptoms. You've heard people say, I have, you know, pins and needles in my hands. You know, I have terrible, terrible fatigue. So all of these are an impact of, of living with cancer. Some people are so debilitated and they're like immobilized, either immobilized physically by that fatigue or by just fear, right? And they don't wanna leave their house. They don't wanna um, engage with others. Some of us like will have this, like, what does this mean for me? What's the personal meaning in me having cancer, right? Why, why is this happening to my family? Um, 
So there's a lot of that emotional kind of soul searching that happens. Sometimes socially, our relationships get strengthened, right? There's like a band of brothers, you know, whether that be through support groups, you know, a, um, you know, multiple people that have the same illness, or, you know, it's that families come together. Sometimes it brings people apart. Sometimes bad relationships get worse, right? That there's um, more friction and tension. Um, so, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about that, that isolation where you might pull yourself back, but there's other times where your illness um, doesn't make you fit in. Say you are um, in a golf league, right? And you can't golf because you're just not feeling up to it. You know, there's an isolation, like, you know, you were, that was part of your social network is this golf league. So a lot, you know, it affects all these aspects. Again, looking at it on the positive side, right? That there's this new club. We talked about the new club nobody wanted to be in. Well, now you're in this club that does bring people into your life that are often fascinating that you wouldn't have met if you didn't have this shared experience. Um, spiritually, some people, their faith is deepened. Sometimes they question it. Sometimes they, they lose all faith. Um, sometimes they are reaffirmed, right? Then they find God again or spirit again. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, again, sort of, you know, it's all aspects of who we are. And I guess I make such a point because I don't know in, you know, uh, in Western medicine, we really focus on that whole being, right? And it, with all due respect, again, to the oncologist say, you know, they have such a very serious job, right? They need to be making sure that the killing of cancer cells is the, their primary focus. Then them managing those physical symptoms of you living with uh, during your, your disease process where they can prescribe therapies or dose reduce, that's their primary focus. And this is the part that is palliative care that I'm excited to talk to you about because we really focus on all of those dimensions of people. Another big thing, obviously, is sometimes if you're the breadwinner in the family and you're not working and it depends on what your benefits are, sometimes there's a loss of income. Um, sometimes your family really suffers uh, and there's lots of resources. That, and again, palliative care and social services can be very helpful. And that's part of this uh, walking this journey is, is that self-advocacy, making sure that if you're not getting these things, just knowing that these things exist and should be available to you and so to ask for them directly and by name. Um, so if you're uninsured, if you have a high deductible kind of an insurance plan, if the co-pays are exorbitant, um, if certain medications are uncovered, you know, if these are trials and things like that, you know, this can be a real financial impact. So kind of like now we've gotten this this news and we are feeling like, okay, now I got to pull it together. <coughs> the one thing I would recommend is <coughs> don't look online. Don't get a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, excuse me, and do an online search about pancreatic cancer. Now, I say that, I'm not saying that I wouldn't do that. I'm telling you that you might be saying like, well, of course that's gonna be the first place I go, but I can tell you it's not gonna make you feel better. It's very likely going to make you feel worse. Um, and that's because it's not tailored to exactly what you're going through. So it's more important that you get started with finding an oncologist and someone that you trust. Either you know somebody that's had a good experience before, um, or you might want to ask your primary care provider or a local medical society, or you know the American Cancer Society or a local cancer organization. It's important that you get some. I think more, um, uh, what's the word, um, um, like not biased advice, because not every oncologist is a specialist too. Even with Anastara, you know, we have some docs that we know we'll send a lot of the, uh, like leukemias and lymphomas to, to. And not to say that every one of the oncologists can't treat leukemia and lymphoma, but there may be somebody that does it more often and is more of a specialist in that. So you really want to tailor it to somebody that really does a lot of your type of care. Um, and there's a great website, There's a, it's called ASCO is this uh, organization. And it's really, 
It does have a lot of patient facing materials, but also does a lot for us as clinicians. Um, it's called the American Society of Clinical Oncology. They have a website called cancer.net. And if you're gonna go anywhere and look up anything, I would recommend that that's the site you use, okay? And all of the materials in there are all vetted by oncologists and they um, approve everything that's posted on ascocancer.net. Um, so please use that if you feel like you need to do that. Um, and you know, it's important that when you're choosing your team that again, it's beyond the medications, it's forming a connection with your team. Um, and we're gonna talk more about uh, who's on that team with you. Um, you know, you wanna really look at the entire practices services. Okay, and so um, I'm happy to say like, you know, like at Astera, we are, um, you know, incorporating in a more formalized way these extra services of social services and um, and palliative medicine. So um, you really want to make sure that there's support groups with the oncology team that you're seeing, that they have navigators, that they have, you know, a plethora of people that are part of this network that are going to take care of you. It's okay to get a second opinion. If you come in and you see our Dr. Porcelli, you know, and you're just not feeling you know, like you're, you're confident, or you just say, you know what, my mom always told me get a second opinion, you're not going to offend Dr. Porcelli. And if a doctor would be offended, then that's not the doctor for you anyway, because you want to have a trusting relationship and, and, a, and a confidence between each other. So it's really uh, okay to go ahead and do that. In terms of like, I, I wrote here, location is important. You know, um, I've lived in Bergen County for many, many years. And so, you know, I had easy access to Manhattan and to all those big hospitals. I did my training at Mount Sinai and Sloan Kettering and, um, and at NYU. And I can tell you, and I've had loved ones in all of those hospitals. Um, I think that in terms of uh, cancer care, um, typically they're run in like algorithms. So, Sometimes it's good that maybe you go to say a specialist, um, you know, at one of the bigger cancer centers, um, but also being mindful that this is often the care requires many stops and many visits. And so you wanna do something that the location works for you and your family and for whomever is bringing you for treatment. Um, so, I just, I don't want to disparage any of the city programs. I just want to uh, explain the importance that uh, if it, that there's an ease of access to getting to your team, okay? The other thing that's important is the ease of access to telephonically getting support. And um, so, you know, we are going through some changes in our organization right now where we are finding that um, we need to improve on that. I would just tell you that you need to be considering that you should be able to pick up the phone and get through. Okay, so look for that also. So when you're talking with your cancer care team, you know, it's important that you come with questions, that you're clear about what, how you like to be communicated with. You know, I like it direct. Please give me the, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Somebody else will say, you know, my daughter takes care of everything. Someone else will say, you know what, listen, I can't handle the, the high hard ones. I just, you know, give me the general flavor for what we're doing. I trust what you want to do, doctor. But it's important that you tell them what your communication style is because they don't know you. And so they might just be very broad stroke in the way they talk to you. Okay. And especially if it's not great news, um, that's harder for them to say to you, right? So if you want that information, you have to make sure it's clear that you're ready, you're ready for that information and that you expect that, okay? I talked before about bringing someone with you, certainly in the first appointment, but if you can bring people, you know, as often as you can, maybe not necessarily when you're in the infusion suite and you're there for treatment, but if you're there and you're uh, coming for appointments, it's always good to have two sets of ears. Um, ensure that you have full disclosure. If you don't, you know, if English isn't your primary language and that's the primary language of your provider, please, please speak up. We all have access. There's, it's an expectation through CMS, you know, Medicare, that all, and even if you're not a Medicare patient, you know, the expectation is that we have access to language lines 
uh, in all languages. So please speak up. You need to be able to understand what the doctor is saying. Um, you need to make sure that you have your hearing aids in and your glasses on and your signing consents and, you know, and that you're not sitting there doubled over in pain because you can't hear if your symptoms aren't managed. And interrupt if you need clarification. You know, advocate for yourself. And if it's your loved one in the room, advocate for them. I mean, I think that there's sometimes there's a good fit and, and sometimes there's not. So, you know, there's a, you know, respectful way to interact. Um, and if it's a good fit, that'll work. If somebody, if a provider is not interested in allowing you to interject and get your needs met or to be direct about your communication style or to make sure you have full disclosure, that's not the doctor for you, okay? Um, or nurse practitioner, because you know, the doctors and the nurse practitioners work well together. And it's, it's important that you feel safe with your team. So it's, it's okay to speak up if this team isn't working for you. Any aspect of that team, any good oncology practice wants to know what your experience is like. So respectfully giving your feedback is really important. Um, you know, we talked about sharing those important aspects of yourself, you know, really disclosing how you're experiencing this, how your family is, you know, when they ask you how you're doing, say how you're doing. One thing I would ask too, make sure that you're very clear about what medications you're on, um, that you make sure that every time you come to the oncology office, if somebody doesn't ask you and go through all of your medications, you should remind them, do you want to go over my medications with me? Because medications change all the time and it's very, very important to your care that there's an, an, uh, an up-to-date medication list on file when the doctor's taking care of you. So partner with the oncology team and any of your medical teams to make sure that your medications are accurate in their records, okay? Keep an open dialogue, be very direct, and ask yourself, is there a sense of trust here? Do I feel safe? And if you don't, then it may not be the right team. Remember, when you have cancer, even if it's highly curable, even if it's stage one, we're talking about you know, a relationship that could last your lifetime in survivorship. You know, it could be if you are diagnosed with a more serious cancer, it may be a relationship also for the rest of your life. It may be that they're gonna help you manage for the next weeks, months, and years while you're living with your cancer until you die from it. So it's really important that the relationship is right. Okay. So you've gotten your team, you're, you've revved yourself up. Now, listen, we can do this. You process this diagnosis, you armed yourself with information, right? I'm gonna give you some resources at the end of this. You contemplate yourself. It's a lot of self-reflection. How do I best cope? And those are the things you need to have in place. Sometimes you have to be honest and say, Certain people benefit you, certain people don't benefit you. You need to be looking out for number one during this. You have to be as strong as, and healthy as possible. Okay, you want to have that, you know, that personal support network that you know has your back and you don't owe anybody anything during this process, okay? I'm not saying you still have to care for your family and this and that, but in terms of other people's feelings, if someone's saying something to you that makes you uncomfortable, it's really important that you're very direct and just, even if it's not direct to them, direct with yourself and you say, I'm not going to associate with that person because it just upsets me, okay? And there's going to be those people that it just doesn't work for you while you're going through this period. Um, you really want to have, you know, relying on your oncology team. Um, but we talked about the preparing for the impact of other people talking about their experiences. Some of them are, you know, insensitive and they don't mean that. They're just don't know what to say. And, you know, I could do an entire lecture just on uh, being a good friend and family member to people living with cancer, because that's a really hard job too, you know, because you always, you know, you don't know what to say. You don't know um, how much to uh, support them. You don't want to infantilize them. At the same time, you want to do what's, what, what feels great to them. Um, so reframing and accepting that you're changing, it hopefully is temporary but that you're gonna change during this period and it's okay. And you may change physically, you may change emotionally and spiritually during this process. Um, 
whatever it is, this journey is there for you, right? And we don't know why it happens to some people and not others, but kind of grabbing it and saying, I can do this. I know what works for me. I'm going to cope with this. I'm going to pull my bootstraps up. I'm going to know that my body's going to change. I know that my heart and mind are going to change. I may have brain fog some days. Doesn't mean I'm losing my mind altogether. This will go away when I'm done with treatment. You know, different things like that. It's going to have to be a patience with yourself. Um, focusing on the activities and relationships that make every day meaningful. Not waiting. Not waiting to buy that $100 perfume. You know, if that's something that you've always wanted. You know, living your life, giving yourself that grace, right? Doing the things that make every day meaningful reconnecting with people, spending more time with your grandchildren, all of those types of things. So what's in your toolkit? What's in your arsenal, right? This personal network, you have people that are really good with practical things, right? I can take you to the doctor. I can take you food shopping. I can pick up groceries for you. I can bring food to your house, right? You got your practical team. Then there are people that are more warm and fuzzy. They're your emotional team, right? Understand what who those players are even on your professional team right on my professional care team who's my warm and fuzzy who's going to be the person that's very practical and appreciate that they come from different angles and this interdisciplinary team is what makes this work right you're not going to get everything out of everybody on your team but you have a right to get everything so you just have to make sure that you recognize that and ask for those things and if you're not getting them it's up to your team to start to provide those, okay? So this is an, um, an important point. So my, I lost my breast, my, my best friend, breast friend, to breast cancer uh, about five years ago. And uh, because I was a nurse, a nurse practitioner, she asked me if I would be her point person. And so basically I did like, you know, all the emails to everybody, I kept everybody in the loop and everybody wasn't texting her. In the beginning, they all were, they were all calling her totally, totally overwhelming. She really was like giving so much energy to everybody else and making them feel better about the fact that she had cancer. Um, and she was trying to keep her own hopes alive and, and she's like caring for everyone else. So I was basically her scribe and I would attend all of her doctor meetings with her uh, we lived in different states, but I would like be through like telehealth or through, um, you know, FaceTime. And then after the meeting, I would just confirm with her how much she wanted to share. And then I happen to use this website called caringbridge.org. Um, and it's a free site. And I would just invite people to, you know, kind of log on after each one of her visits and they could get all the updates and then they could give her all kinds of support. So they would write in there like, you know, way to go or glass for that green scan or blah, 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 or hang it, whatever, right? Um, so that was really helpful. And her mom was like the organizer. You know, she did all of her planning of her appointments and everything like that. So find your point person or people to do these practical things because uh, that can be overwhelming. A lot of people think I don't want a support group. I, you know, I don't need a support group. Um, you know, that, that that's not for me. Um, it's interesting when you, almost like when I talked about that golf league the, before, um, you know, it's like you're with like people and it's not like all ho-hum, you know, and sadness when people come together in a support group, in a support group with like people, you know, especially, you know, that, that facilitator understands, you know, gets to understand the dynamics of the group. Um, and tries to really meet the needs of everybody and, and directs the conversation. And there's a lot of really beautiful support that comes out of that. And so when we talked about those um, pluses and minuses of being in this new club, sometimes people meet these extraordinary individuals that they wouldn't have met had they not had cancer and they weren't going through this at the exact same moment, living in the same county or whatever. Um, so it, it is important that you know, some people are much more reserved and feel like that's not the right mechanism for me, but not to just assume it's not, because this is the most, uh, this is such a unique period in your life. It's not like joining debate club, you know, or something like that, you know, and that's not for me, or I'm not a theater person, so I'm not going to go out for drama. This is very different. 
Okay, and there's a lot that comes out of that. And continuing to move is important, continuing to oxygenate yourself and keep your muscles strong. And one of the most important things uh, you could do to kind of combat fatigue, which is very hard to do, um, is to try and keep active, to try and uh, keep moving. And it doesn't mean CrossFit, it means just keeping moving, even if it's moving, sitting in the chair, okay? But just doing something to keep the blood flowing and stuff. And that's also really good for your brain. And lastly, getting that gook out of you and journaling. And, um, you know, some people say that's not my thing either. You know, if you feel like you're ruminating and spinning and you can't get out of that, it's really important that you put that somewhere because that instead is going to get deep seated and, and it could potentially impact your recovery. So it's important to kind of get all that out. Okay. I didn't write this here, but sometimes it's about also that outward expression of, you know, some people go to a drumming circle and pound. Some people go to the woods and scream, you know, there's ways that you have to get this stuff out. That's part of your, your arsenal. That's part of your toolkit. So now you're going to be doing stuff that you never thought you'd have to think about, right? All this decision making. So you've picked your team, right? Now your doctors talk to you about treatment. We could do chemo only. We could do chemo with immunotherapy. You've gone to cancer.net. You've looked it up. You, you know, you felt like you feel comfortable with your team. Um, you feel safe with that oncologist. You take that recommendation. Um, but there's a process, right, to that decision, right? Now, let's just say that, you know, you progress through a couple lines of treatment and the cancer is still growing, right? Then you might be faced with that, like, what are the benefits and burdens of the treatment? Um, what are the benefits and burdens when you even talk about side effects, right? Some of them that are not reversible. Um, you know, am I going to roll the dice and, you know, hopefully get to the point of cancer free, but I may always have neuropathic pain. Um, most of it usually goes away in time, but if you know anybody with cancer that's been through certain types of treatment, they may tell you, I still feel like I can't feel the bottoms of my feet or the tips of my fingers. Um, that may not be a reason to not do treatment. It's just, these are the things you have to think about. Um, this is an important point talking about advanced care planning. So we can't talk to each other. I wish we were in person, but, um, I would ask you, I would ask you to raise your hand how many of you have an advanced directive. If you even want to put that in the chat, I can use that in another talk in the future about like, you know, just the group of us, how many of us have advanced directives. You know, the thing is when we are forced to think about advanced care planning, once we um, are sick, that's a very different conversation, right? Than when we're well. So I did my advanced care planning documents when I didn't have any illnesses. So it's a little easier because you're not directly like sort of facing your mortality in those decisions. That being said, at any moment in time that you decide that you made this document, say when I made this document 15 years ago, it doesn't feel authentic to me now, you can always change that document. So you're not held to that decision forever and ever. Okay, it could always be changed. And every time you go to the hospital or to the doctor and you've made a change, you should be bringing them copies of these directives, these documents, okay, because they should have them as current um, on file. If, say, you go to a hospital and they say, oh, you know, it's on file, and you say to them, I didn't bring a copy, but it's on file, advocate for yourself to say, can you bring me the copy that you have? If you know that you've made an, uh, adjustments, you want to make sure that it's not the old one that's still on file, okay? Um, a patient recently came to me and asked me, is there a central repository for advanced care planning documents? She had learned of one. Now, I've been doing this a very, very long time, and I can tell you I've never gone to this site to look to see if someone has an advanced directive. That being said, in the state of New Jersey, I've been on many task, for task forces where we've been discussing you know, a central repository. I've done that within three different hospitals, talk to them about creating a repository in the hospital. So I think we don't have that quite nailed down yet. So it's really important that you advocate for yourself and that your um, most current documents are available to the people that would need them 
in the event that you can't speak for yourself. So let's talk about those documents real quick. Um, so a healthcare proxy is basically, you can call that a surrogate decision maker, um, uh, you know, a, a medical guardian. Um, basically, that's naming somebody to make your healthcare decisions and speak on your behalf should you not be able to, so that should you have, you know, either a mental impairment or be too, too critically ill to be able to make decisions on your behalf, this person should uh, be able to speak your words and be your advocate. They're not supposed to, you know, um, process the information and come up with their own decision. This role is that they are speaking on your behalf. Right, that they understand your general constitution, who you are. And so you don't just name somebody as a healthcare proxy and not tell them. You have to have a conversation. You don't have to have an in depth conversation. You don't need to talk about it at nauseum, but you should let someone know sort of how do you generally feel about if things went south? You know, if things got bad, how do you want this to look? How far do you want to push? Okay. A living will is also called. Um, an instruction directive, right? It's instruction, right? It's more specific to whether or not you would want a certain type of treatment or you'd want a feeding tube, if you'd want a ventilator, you'd want cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Um, the thing is about a living will or an instruction directive is one, sometimes they're emotionally very hard to complete, right? Two, sometimes they're hard to complete because you don't know. Right? I don't know what I'll want in that moment. The last thing that I find that's the hardest is that each one of these documents comes up with a criteria in which it gets like activated, right? And sometimes it's hard to meet the criteria because you can't put every single medical scenario into a document ever. So it's challenging to say then, um, you know, did someone meet the exact criteria in there for now us to do X or not do X that's written in the document, okay? So I would tell you what's most important is that you name that healthcare proxy. If you don't wanna do the living will portion and the instruction directive for the, you know, the, the couple of reasons I just shared, it's, but it's most important that you have in writing who it is you want to make decisions on your behalf and that you've had that conversation with them and that they are comfortable advocating for that, okay? Some people will do their own thing, okay? So for example, you know, so, and I've heard spouses and, and siblings say to each other, I could never live without you. So no matter what you want, like I'm keeping you going, you know? Well, that might not be the person that you wanna be on the document making decisions for you if that's not how you feel, if you have limits. So you don't wanna just be kept going, right? And vice versa. So. It's just a really important decision. Um, I don't have it on here, but I want to mention that there's a legal hierarchy too. So in the absence of having these forms, right, they, the, um, I, I don't even know, it's likely federal, um, but I know it's definitely in New Jersey, that the, the hierarchy is um, if you're an adult, then the, and, and you have a spouse or a domestic partner, that person will automatically be your healthcare proxy should you be incapacitated to make decisions for yourself. If you don't have a spouse or a domestic partner, then you need, then I think it goes to your, um, if you're an adult, it goes to your adult children. If you don't have adult children, it will go to your parents. If you don't have adult, adult parents, that's ridiculous. If you don't have parents, then, you know, it would go to uh, your siblings. If you don't have siblings, then it might go to another distant family member. So it's important. Some people have too many families. Some people have not enough family. Either way, you need to pick the right person and you should document it. If all else fails and you don't do this form, just know that that's the hierarchy. So you want to make sure that whoever that person is that falls into place in your life, that that would be the person that you would want to trust. You know, if that's the case, it's not as big of a deal for this form. But I'll tell you, you're gonna get asked again and again and again. And it's a little bit painful when you're living with cancer to be asked again and again, do you have a living will? Do you have a healthcare proxy? Do you have a pulse form, which we're gonna talk about in a minute? You know, you rather just be like, yeah, I do. And you hand it over rather than them say, oh, well, do you wanna meet with somebody and talk about your wishes? It's like, just get the work done. 
I think of it almost like um, uh, like an insurance policy. You know, what a pain in the butt. Like when you're, you know, you you know, you're redoing a, you know, your homeowner's policy or your car insurance, and they're going over. You know, do you want three hundred, five hundred? Do you want a five hundred dollar deductible? Do you want that? Right. It's just such a pain. So once you get it done, though, then you just put the insurance policy in the filing cabinet. In this case, you would be giving your doctors to, I mean, these documents to your medical providers. But in terms of an insurance policy and the similarities, then it's gone. Then you give it away. You don't have to think about it again. You have it, you know, and only in the event of that medical emergency where you can't make decisions for yourself, do those documents come into place. And if you have decision making capacity, it doesn't matter what you have written down. Nobody's going to say, oh, well, you wrote down here that you don't want resuscitation. And you're sitting there going, uh, yeah, I want you to put the breathing tube in. I'm saying I want it now. You know, they're not going to say, well, you wrote it on the paper. Okay, it's only in the event that you can make decisions for yourself. An advanced directive is this compilation of having the healthcare proxy and the instruction directive together in one document. Okay, that's all that means. And a pulse form is different in that it's actionable doctor's orders. You may have seen it before. Um, I actually have obviously from all these forms, but in particular, a pulse form in New Jersey, you know, looks like this. It's green. It has the little caduceus in the middle. Okay. It's only one page. The back is just instructions for the person completing it. And this is actually a doctor's order sheet, just like a prescription, okay, would be. And the doctor or the nurse practitioner, the physician assistant, any of that, those uh, providers can sign this document once they've gone over it with you, right? So if you don't have decision making capacity, this the ship has sailed. You can't make these any of these documents, okay? So it's not like your kids can come in and say, "I want to do an advanced directive or a pulse for my, you know, my mom who has dementia." Nope, the ship has sailed. These are all documents done by the patient, okay? So. I see we're kind of running low on time, so I can always do something at another time. If you guys are interested, let Catherine know we could talk about these forms a little bit more. But this is very similar in that it talks about what your wishes are, but it's an emergency document like a prescription that says whether or not somebody wants um, hospital care, just comfort care, whether or not they want a feeding tube, yes or no, whether or not they want an, um, a ventilator, yes or no whether or not that they would want CPR, yes or no. Okay, that's basically the crux of this form. Okay, and a do not resuscitate order is again a little bit different in that basically that's an emergency. What would you do if you, if, if you, if, if they walked into my office right now and I was unresponsive and my heart had stopped, would I want them to come in and do CPR and try and resuscitate me? And again, this is a conversation for another day there are times that that um, that, that um, activity is in the word the procedure is meaningful right but it's not often meaningful in people that are already dying right if you're already in that terminal phase of life it's very unlikely that we're going to bring somebody back period never mind to a better quality of life than they had before they had cardiac arrest so there's more to talk about in, in there too. And then there's always that decision, when do you say when? <coughs> when do we transition to hospice care? Okay, so now all that doom and gloom about decision-making, right? So now let's just kind of elevate it again, right? That we're talking about living with cancer, right? So we have to maintain hope and a lot of that is on ourselves, right? Finding that within our, you know, within our spirit, right? That you know, the sun will rise again. Every morning that sun rises, right? And we have to do that positive self-talk. You have to recognize and appreciate that intense love that you often get when you have a, you know, a diagnosis like this and accept that love, accept that people want to help you. And again, you'll have your practical folks, you'll have your emotional folks, right? But accept that help. And, and that's kind of the gift that comes out of things like that is this and we talked about it before, these, this strengthening of relationships. And then there's also this kind of fracturing of these negative relationships and pushing them away from your journey. Um, and that helps you also remain up, right? If this is somebody that doesn't uh, allow you to be in that more hopeful state. 
And, and about hope in particular, you know, it's important that sometimes hope changes what we're hoping for changes, that it's a, uh, it's a very fluid um, feeling, right? And so there's going to be times that we just hope that the pain goes away. Another day, it's all about hoping that the cancer goes away. Uh, it may be about hoping that I can keep this down uh, and gain a pound because I feel so nauseous all the time and so on ease, right? So what we're maintaining in terms of hope changes all the time and being okay with that fluidity that, you know, um, that you are going to change during this journey. And, and you know, hopefully you're gonna rise above it. Um, but even if it doesn't end in survivorship and it ends in dying, there's still hope all along the way. It just keeps changing. Um, be open to mental health services, you know, and, and mental health medication. A lot of people are afraid of getting hooked on things. Some people feel that they're weak if they, uh, you know, if they are, you know, in a circumstance where they, you know, are going to a therapist. Some people, they know in the therapy forever and are very comfortable. Okay, but I can tell you here at Estera, in every single one of our patient rooms, we have an entire list of, of therapists and what insurances they take and all these things in every single county. So if you are seeing doctors here with us, please um, ask for one of those forms if you're feeling like, you know, you could use some, some extra mental health support. And we talked before about eating healthfully and exercising regularly because all of that just boosts our endorphins. So our action, right? What's our plan? We're gonna heal. That's what this heart is with the stitches, right? And we're gonna uh, we're gonna thrive, right? This this little um, it's probably a weed just peeking through the asphalt there. So I want to talk to you a little bit about my specialty, right? Of palliative and supportive care, um, and I'm gonna give you a resource at the end where you can look this up and and learn a little bit more. But this is a compliment for anybody living with serious illness and not just cancer. So serious means, you know, it, it, it can be life-threatening, right? Anything can happen. Even a stage one, you could have treatment and, and you know, have uh, a side effect or something that, that's, you know, causes you to be seriously ill. Um, but this is a support. It complements. It works alongside aggressive and curative treatment. And palliative care is often misrepresented as being hospice care. And hospice also has a, a very important role. Um, but it's not hospice. It's really, it works alongside it. I'm going to show you um, a graphic that explains that best, okay? Um, and then all that we do, we focus on the relief of suffering and trying to make you improve, you know, the way you're living, while you're living with serious illness, right? That's all I do all day long is I look at pain and symptoms and the emotional effects of the experience of living in this, in, in, now in this role uh, for, for, you know, people with cancer. Um, and doing everything that I can to, to put the right tools in place. So whether that be care coordination or that be physical pain and symptom management or helping with decision-making and documents and things like that, that's what we do. We treat these symptoms, we're experts in pain management and in distress and uh, symptoms like nausea and vomiting and constipation and diarrhea and anxiety and depression and fatigue and lymphedema and all these things that are the consequences of oftentimes cancer and cancer treatment, right? Uh, so I, I, we talked about that we help with planning and the goal setting. My job, I feel like, is to look at your overall experience. And what I'm bringing to you, Sarah, is that every single person that touches a cancer patient and their loved one should be concerned about that overall experience and that we all are part of your care team. Um, and that's what palliative care does. So it encourages you know, this, like I talked about care, um, care coordination and communication, working with our providers to talk to them about talking to you um, and how to be upfront and how to talk to you in the communication style that you've identified is the way you like to receive information um, and about, you know, the transitions and when it's time to transition to survivorship. Sometimes that's scary. Sometimes and oftentimes it's, it's scary to think that we're going to transition into hospice. And so our role is to help Kind of soften the blow of either one of those and support you through that. And so it's covered by most insurance plans. <clears throat> Certainly, if it comes to Estera, it should be uh, covered. Sometimes there are some co pays, specifically if you come in with palliative care providers, you know, in, uh, <clears throat> in a sep separate meeting outside of meeting with the oncologist or maybe another co pay. So just to be aware of that. So you want to ask your insurance. 
and how do you get palliative care? Not everybody has it. Um, in most oncology, it's like embedded, but now more and more oncology practices are bringing in people that just do this or to, you know, to complement uh, what, what uh, you know, the practice is offering. So you just are, you know, you just ask your oncologist uh, for a palliative care consult and ask them if they have palliative care services. That's how you get it. So sorry, this is a little bit blurry, but <clears throat> so if you look at the top, um, you know, I, I don't know if you see my, I think you probably do see my arrow, right? This is the old way of thinking about, about medicine, not just um, hospice, uh, excuse me, not just um, uh, cancer care, right? But right, everything is focused on the disease, right? And we're just focus, 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 focus. All those other things that I said are about palliative care, that interdisciplinary focus, who you are spiritually, who you are socially, who you are financially, who you are, you know, uh, in physically with your pain and symptoms, right? That's not all disease directed care, right? That is palliative care. And in the, you know, in years ago, we never thought about that. We were just, you know, just pedal to the metal and disease directed care the entire time. And then only when it looked really ominous did they call in palliative care. And maybe, and most of the time, patients would die on that and never even get to hospice. Okay. Now, really, there's a focus, and, and I almost wish I could. Um, uh, there's, I've, I've seen another model, uh, but I couldn't get it to attach here. It's where actually palliative care is kind of more up here. Um, and so it's, like I said, it's concurrent with the disease-directed care. But let's just say that, you know, you're diagnosed with a stage one. You might need somebody from palliative care or not at all, but your doctor may be focused on the symptoms associated or the physical, emotional needs that you have. But everything is really focused primarily on killing this cancer, right? And then as you know, if things are not going so well, you know, and we're, and we're running through our options, you know, palliative care takes a bigger uh, piece of the puzzle here now, you know, really focusing on the experience. And maybe we can't, you know, bat that cancer down, but we can focus more intensively on pain and symptom management and those uh, symptoms, okay? So, um, and we could be preparing and we could be talking and we could be, you know, uh, doing some goal setting and doing our advanced care planning. And then we're gonna start hospice earlier because hospice is really built for somebody that's living with cancer or with, excuse me, any serious illness. And I'm gonna to talk to you in a minute about what we call the surprise question. And that's people that we, that we think are gonna live six months or less. This is a benefit that most Americans have earned. You know, this is, a, you know, um, um, it, it's based out of the Medicare hospice benefit. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more in the, in, later, but what Medicare did, even if you're not hospice eligible, um, excuse me, Medicare eligible, there are opportunities for other insurance carriers to emulate the hospice benefit through Medicare. And they say if the patient has six months or more to live, all, this cadre of services is the expert level care for people at that stage. So we really would like to see people benefit from that sooner during the dying phase and not just at the death phase. And then what hospice does is it continues to offer support for your family for the next 13 months after the patient dies. So survivorship, I have a good link for you on that. Uh, please consider that when you are cured of your cancer, that you would um, embrace a survivorship program. It's an individualized roadmap for everybody. Some of them, they're considered from the moment you're diagnosed with cancer, you're considered a survivor. Other ones, it's once you finish all your curative treatment or you're just in maintenance therapy that you're considered in survivorship. And the goal is not just surviving, it's thriving and getting your life back to your post-cancer life, providing surveillance, access to these cancer experts. If your team continues to be your team, maybe not exactly the way it used to look, but especially like I can speak for Astera and also other, most other cancer programs, they have usually a nurse practitioner or a physician that runs survivorship that makes sure that you're an, a, attached to us and we continue to monitor and manage your symptoms. Uh, sometimes it takes a while for fatigue and pain and insomnia and anxiety or the fear of reoccurrence to go away, that neuropathic pain. So it's important that you're still linked in with us. Um, we still continue to communicate with primary care, 
you can still see us in the office um, for even, you know, up to years after your cancer treatment. And some cancer treatment has a, you know, cardiotoxic effect. Sometimes there's emotional side effects of living with cancer. And so we want to be involved to help you uh, support you through your survivorship. Um, and so there's another group, interestingly, called Metavivors. And that's for a group of patients with metastatic cancer, which uh, likely you know is, is cancer that is not curable, um, but there's so many treatments. And sometimes somebody is diagnosed with metastatic cancer and they're gonna die soon. And some people are living with metastatic disease because of new treatments and therapies for years and years and years. So there is that cadre of, of people that are living knowing that they have cancer and that it's not curable. Um, and they may be living terrific lives, but supporting those metavivors is also part of a survivorship program. And right now, there's a lot of, um, it kind of came out of the metastatic breast cancer movement, but I, I anticipate that we're going to start to see this for other types of uh, metavivors as well, other kinds of cancer, uh, metastatic cancer um, survivors and, and people living with metastatic disease. Okay, we're down to like the last three slides. So I just, I want you to, if you can hang in there with me. Um, so hospice care. So it's a program it's, it, it, that's specially designed just to meet the needs of these terminally ill folks and their loved ones. It's not just for the patient, just like oncology care is not just for the patient, it's for everybody. But as I described before, it's an insurance benefit that comes out of probably the early 80s, came out of England and then uh, Medicare recognized that patients were dying without the right supports in place. And so they basically looked at the relief of pain and suffering, right, which is palliative care, and made a package um, of folks and equipment and supplies and medications that would be all covered underneath this bundle um, where they would focus on what the needs of people are that when their disease is going to take its natural course, we think you're going to live six months or less. Okay. People often choose hospice very late. And so it has the reputation of, uh, you know, being just when you go into hospice care, you die right away. And I would love to challenge you all to see it differently so that you and your loved ones can uh, appreciate the benefits of this, you know, this expert level care um, during this time of intense need so that you can experience the end of your life better. Um, and it, when appropriate, sign on sooner so that you can show somebody else uh, through example that it's not just for people with hours and days to live, okay? This is for people living with cancer. And I used to be a hospice director. Uh, I had patients going to Atlantic City and to Florida and, and for spa treatments. and and living during camp, uh, during hospice care. They were, you know, we also do a lot of important things. I say we, I used to be in hospice, um, you know, where we did life closure work with people. Um, you know, we did stuff for children and uh, like we had child life specialists on our team. But what comes with this package is a hospice physician and your oncologist can continue to be what's called the attending. So those two doctors continue to work together the entire time you're on hospice. And if uh, you choose to say use your primary care doctor as the, the, the attending, or your, your oncologist is not um, available to be the um, attending, there's still always a connection back to your oncologist. And I can tell you again, and this is not a commercial for Estera, I can only tell you that what we are building is <coughs> relationships with, with the hospices where the expectation is that they're giving us regular updates so that our oncologists know what's happening to our patient. Because oftentimes you've had these relationships with oncologists for years and years. So it's really important that they are still part of your care network and your care team. Your nurse practitioners that come out and assess for um, continued eligibility for the program. There's a nurse that's uh, like a case manager that each patient gets a nurse. They visit typically once or twice a week if things are 
you know, there's symptoms or there's things going on, they might visit more frequently than that. There's always 24 hour on call. So today I spoke to a patient and I know she really needs to have somebody in the middle of the night available to her. And she really is hospice eligible and she's not been feeling like emotionally she could accept that language. And it's uh, speaking of language, people will say, well, they should change the name of hospice care. They, you should change the name of palliative care. These all have very negative connotations. Um, I argue then you should change the name of oncology care, right? Because that doesn't have a positive connotation. Uh, it's more important that we, we, we lead by example and that we train each other about where these different things fit, right? And that they're not all bad and ugly and that not to be morose, but we're all going to die. All of us on this call, and hopefully we have, um, you know, if we have time to prepare, um, that we are living the best we can until we do die. So it's the one specialty that everybody will need. Not everybody will need an oncologist, right? But everybody could benefit from hospice care. Um, I say it like, you know, if I needed a, a shoulder replacement, I'm not going to go to the cardiologist, right? I'm going to go to a, a shoulder specialist and somebody that's, uh, you know, excellent. Right, so I'm going to do my homework, and I'm going to make sure that I'm with the best shoulder replacement, you know, physician. We should be doing the same thing and revere the end of our lives the same way we do, you know, picking an obstetrician. Um, you know, it's really, really important that we make a good choice, that we choose a good program, and that we reap the benefits by gaining a relationship with that team earlier than later. Okay. So back to my lady from today, you know, I think she needs support in the middle of the night and everything. And finally, her pain is so out of control that, you know, we're not open 24 hours a day. And, uh, you know, we have a doctor on call and everything, but we don't have access to medication in the middle of the night. Um, and hospices do, and they have nurses that go to the home. So there's just this comfort level with knowing that you have somebody there sort of in your pocket, should you need it in the middle of the night. Some people will say, I don't need a social worker, I don't need a chaplain. These are specialists for people in this period of life. There are very unique needs for people that are terminally ill, and these folks are experts um, in, in taking care of those very unique details um, and life closure um, opportunities. So it's um, that complement uh, it's very important. And in fact, we have those same people, not the on call, but we have doctors, nurse practitioners, nurses, social workers, chaplains, all on the palliative care team also. Again, because, you know, a medical provider can't provide spiritual care, care or know all the community resources and things like that. Another real benefit of, of hospice care is home health aid hours, typically through Medicare, um, you can have up to 20 hours of home health aides to come into your home. I'm not going to lie to you. There's a massive, massive home health aid shortage. People are just not going into that business right now. Um, so hospices, even though the patients may need it, they're having a hard time sometimes filling that. But just know that they're, they're always trying. And um, this does more of the hands-on sort of uh, incontinence care and bathing and sometimes light housework and things like that. Sometimes it just gives respite to somebody if their home health aid is coming for two hours, that caregiver can go out and, you know, get some fresh air, go for a walk, do the food shopping, something, okay? Um, hospice can happen anywhere that the patient is and wherever they call home, right? So some people, a nursing home is the home and assisted living is the home. Um, sometimes there's, a, a, you know, a hospice house those are much less uh, common. A lot of hospice done is, is done in nursing homes and in assisted living facilities. And then it's more complex than we have to talk about today. But again, if you're interested, you can tell Catherine and we could have more of a dialogue about this. But there's different levels of hospice care. Um, also giving you a link to hospice at the end of the presentation. So um, you could do some research on your own, uh, but there are opportunities to have hospice in the hospital, but that's infrequent, that's rare, and typically those patients are very uncomfortable, and that's why they're needing this higher acuity hospice care. 
Um, it's not just for people that are like comfortably dying. And of course, that's what we're wishing for, right? Is that people just gently slip away and they're comfortable. So most people don't meet the criteria of hospice in the hospital. And uh, so they misunderstand that when they are at the hospital. And, and sometimes doctors will say, <clears throat> what do you mean they're dying? Of course they should get hospice care. But it's a very highly regulated program and there's reasons why um, it's not offered there for everyone. And then I mentioned before that any supplies you need, so say there's wounds or there's tubes and the hospice pays for all of that, you never see a bill. Say you need equipment, you need a Hoyer lift, you need a recliner chair, you need a hospital bed, you need oxygen. There's no special uh, criteria you need to meet. There's no special prescriptions. The hospice just calls. They have an, um, an association and a contract with a local vendor and the stuff just shows up at your house. And it can be within one day. You know, the same day we admit patients to hospice. That lady I was just talking about that needs on call. Um, that hospice is actually going to probably will admit her before the end of the day today. Um, and then any medications related to the hospice diagnosis, so anything related to pain and symptoms, um, say the patient's got pancreatic cancer, pancreatic enzymes will be covered, things like that. Um, and so that's often nice too. And many hospices will deliver medications to that. So when it when is when, right? When is the transition time? So I think this is what we tell physicians, the surprise question. Would you be surprised if this person died within the next six months? And if that doctor is emphatically like, well, no, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, they could live longer, but I would not be surprised. Then they may be eligible to all of those services, you know? And that's the thing. You don't want to miss out on this expert level care, the shoulder replacement doctor for a shoulder replacement, you know? versus a cardiologist, like these are experts in taking care of people in the terminal phase of life. So we want to use these services sooner, okay? And choosing hospice and that language doesn't make the death come sooner. In fact, sometimes people live longer because their symptoms are better managed, their families aren't out of you know, control and in terrible distress because they're supported. And in fact, people will, like I said, live longer and it just eases the entire transition. Um, so there's really, there's no downside to choosing hospice in this circumstance, unless you're still trying a medication that's disease directed. And in that case, if you're still on chemotherapy or immunotherapy or something like that, then the hospice program cannot admit you to services. So back to the question at over an hour ago, about the benefit versus, versus burden, we have to think about that, right? We have to think about, um, you know, is the benefit of this immunotherapy when I'm terminally ill worth missing out on the benefits of hospice, right? So we have, so there, and that's where palliative care comes in and is helpful, but your cancer care team also can help you kind of process and move through those decisions. So this is basically my last slide, and, and I just want to empower you. I, I don't want to upset you to end on the hospice note, right? But that's sort of where it fits within, you know, the, the, the scheme. We are hoping that, you know, if, if you're living with cancer or someone you love is, that it's a curable cancer. But if it's not, just knowing that there are all kinds of services for you, including taking care of people right to the, you know, to the end of their lives, and that you have a right to have compassion and empathy from your team. And if you're not getting that, you're not with the right team. Uh, oh, I didn't mean the right, honestly, you're, you have the, the, um, the, the right to have honest communication, that your doctors are direct with you, um, that you have access to the latest innovations and clinical trials. So you want to be with a, a, you know, an oncology group that has access to all of that. And blessedly, we live, you know, in the Northeast and we live in New Jersey and there's doctors on every corner. It's not like we're in rural Idaho, you know, so you should be able to have a program that has access to clinical trials, um, that people recognize you and personalize their care, that they're open to asking questions, that, you know, remembering that you have a right to those answers. And if you're not getting those answers, you know, that you advocate for yourself and make sure that you get your answers so that you're not squirreling with worry um, sometimes the things you're worrying about are much worse than the reality of the information. And even if the information is bad, 
it still is what it is, whether you know it or not. So it's important that you use your strengths to process that, use mental health support providers, use palliative care people, use your nurses, use everybody on this team to support you. Those wraparound support services or all those things I've been talking about for the last hour. You have a right to be able to get in, to get an appointment, you know, to get your cancer treatment on time. If that's not happening, advocate for yourself. If someone says they're not getting the authorization, press, press, press. Don't wait. Sometimes you get paralyzed with fear. And so, you know, you're not active. You know, every minute counts. So you want to be able to, you know, if the doctor says, I want to start therapy in a week, you know, if there's an issue, you have to act advocate for that. You have a right to getting your treatment. Um, so the open communication and to this relationship that's likely going to last a lifetime, whether it be through survivorship or it be through death, you know, having a trusting relationship with your team. So in ending, you know, just saying that like thriving is a frame of mind, right? And I've given you a lot of ideas and a lot of those wraparound support services that can help you thrive. Um, but that keeping your hope alive is so important and understanding that hope changes, um, you know, that throughout your whole process, it's going to be defined and redefined again, but not to lose hope, that there's always hope for something else, um, even if it's not disease-directed treatment. There's always thriving. Um, so just to be mindful of that and be with a team that embraces that theory and that concept with you. Um, if you have questions for me, Astera has a website here. It's palliative at asterahealth.com. Um, and then I've given you some resources here. I don't know if Catherine can send this page out to you, um, you know, where there's, the, the, there's a, I gave you an FAQ about these different types of forms. I gave you access to getting that New Jersey Pulse form. But on that state.nj.us, you'll also be able to get a healthcare proxy form, an advanced directive form, a living will, or an instruction directive, you'll be able to get those forms on there, okay? This is a, a kind of a simple site, but getpalliativecare.org. Uh, go on there. There's one for providers. There's like a link for providers, and then there's a link for um, patients and families. Information on survivorship at that cancer.net. Please go to cancer.net for like anything. I think it's a wonderful website. And then there's some um, information about hospice. You can go to the Hospice Foundation. There's tons of hospice information out there. Um, and hospicecompared.gov, if you are trying to decide between different agencies, there are quality metrics that every hospice agency that receives Medicare funding, and most of them are, need to input this data into this website. And so you can compare how well do they manage symptoms? How well do they manage um, conversation? How well do they communicate? How timely are their services? And all of that. So you can kind of put in there, you know, Grace Hospice next to Seasons Hospice next to the VNA and compare some of that stuff. Now that doesn't speak to everything, right? But if you're one of those data type people, <clears throat> that gives you a little bit of data. And to the 16 people that are still on the call, I am offering to you my personal services. You can email me at palliative at asteracare.org. If you want to talk about any of these things, I'll be happy to uh, kind of uh, have a conversation with you and help you the best that I can. We have okay. time for questions, if there are any. Uh, yes, yeah, so if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat box and I'll read them out loud. And um, yeah, so earlier, Tina, you had asked people to type in um, mm -hmm. and they actually no one typed anything in about like if they were a survivor or if they were diagnosed. So okay. that's well, why I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, but I'm mad at you guys for that. But no, it's OK. It's sometimes awkward to talk about these kinds mm -hmm. of things. Did anybody see the, the one comment in the chat though? I can I can read that. It's so sad that I didn't have access to this information when I was diagnosed in April. You cannot second guess how you will react. React. 
I panicked and I wanted treatment ASAP and I didn't give myself time for a second opinion. The wait for appointment was long and I feared my cancer would spread. So we kind of touched on all of those things, right? Just advocating for yourself. Um, you know, I would probably panic too and want to get immediately started with treatment. And I agree with you, you cannot second guess it. There, I would say the, the minority of people get a second opinion for probably this main reason. And um, uh, to reassure you, there are, you know, like I said before, there are algorithms that, you know, most uh, diseases, you know, um, you know, there's pathways that the physicians choose. There is some, uh, uni you know, unique uh, aspects of the treatment plan. So some doctors might do something a little bit different. Um, but for the most part, there's a lot of guidance for them. <clears throat> so I hope you're doing well. And if I can help you in any way, please let me know. And thank you for sharing. Thank you so much for your time today. I am really honored that you took the time to, to spend an hour and now a half with me. And, um, and I just really appreciate it. And I wish you all the best and good health. Yeah, and thank you so much, Tina, for spending all this time talking and explaining everything for to to us here. It's a very important topic, and um, so also thank you for everyone for joining us and staying with us throughout this program. And our next upcoming Astera Cancer class is new treatments and clinical trials for multiple myeloma, lymphoma, and other blood disorders, and that will be taking place on Friday, November twelfth at 12 p.m. noon. So for more information or to register, you can check the library's event page at ebpl.org slash calendar. So thank you everyone for joining us for today's talk. Take care and stay safe. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for today's episode. You can enjoy our previous episodes by subscribing now using your favorite podcasting app. To learn more about the East Brunswick Public Library, visit our website at www.ebpl.org.